Okay, so now that we've discussed uh, the basic structure of the AMPA receptor, we're going to discuss a few more um, little facts about the AMPA receptor. Firstly, I'm going to discuss how you can get more diversity in the structure of these receptors, because so far, what what, from what I've told you, you can only get six different types of AMPA receptors. You can have this GLUA1 homotetrima, this GLUA1, GLUA2 heterotetrima, this GLUA2 homotetrima, this GLUA2, GLUA4 heterotetrima, this GLUA4 homotetrima, and this GLUA2, GLUA3 heterotetrima. So that's six. Uh, that doesn't seem that many. Uh, so what we're going to now look at is a few other ways to get uh, a bit more diversity in the structure of these. And one of the ways is through this flip-flop uh, domain of uh, the, um, of the um, AMPA uh, receptor subunit, basically. Okay, so what is flip-flop? Well, basically, if I draw out the gene for one of these AMPA, um, AMPA receptor subunits. So let's say it's GLUA1, let's say. So to make it a concrete example, I'm just going to use the example of GLUA1. Uh, uh, but you could use any of the others as well. So let's that's that's, let it be GLUA1 for an example. Right, okay. Um, so uh, if this is the gene for GLUA1, uh, then the gene consists of introns and exons. So exons are the portions of the DNA that we're actually going to use in order to uh, code for our protein, basically. And the introns are the portions that we're not going to use. So if I mark the, uh, the exons on by these uh, pink lines, the portion in between the two pink lines is an exon. And these portions uh, that aren't between two green lines, uh, two pink lines rather, they are introns. So that's an intron. This is an exon. Right, okay, uh, so when you transcribe this DNA, when you copy it and produce some mRNA from it, initially what you do is you transcribe the entire gene, introns and all. So you'll get introns and loads of exons in your mRNA, like so. Right, uh, this, um, this piece of mRNA, which is just a direct copy of the coding strand of your DNA, is called pre-mRNA. So basically, from transcription, you go, uh, you get a piece of pre-mRNA. So this is the transcription process. Okay, now what happens is before you turn this into protein, you need to cut out all these portions that you're not actually going to use. Because if you keep them in, then the ribosome will use them, and it will create you something completely different. You know, you're going to have a huge, great lump of amino acids that you didn't mean to have there. So you need to cut those out, and there's a process then known as splicing, which is the process of removing these introns. Okay, so what you end up with is just the exons put together, like so. So in this picture, there's just four exons. You'll just end up with four of them put together, and you'll have a much smaller piece of RNA, which is known as mature mRNA. This mature mRNA is what is then used in the translation process uh, to create your polypeptide, or your, in this case, your GLUA1 polypeptide. So GLUA1 polypeptide. Right. And that's the process of translation. Right, so what is flip-flop? Well, basically, in the GLUA1 gene, this picture is misleading. There are far more exons than just four. And in fact, there is an exon uh, specifically known as exon 14 um, and exon 15. So uh, you're, you have far more exons than just four. And somewhere along here, you'll have... Uh, what, what, which one shall I? We'll use these two as exon 14 and exon 15. So imagine that the picture contains far more exons than I have drawn. And these two here are exons 14 and exons 15. Now, initially, when you copy the DNA, you will have exon 14 and exon 15 in your mRNA. So in your pre-mRNA, you'll have exon 14 and exon 15. Now, both of these are not necessary in order to actually uh, make your protein. You only need one of them. 
So, in the splicing process, you pick which one of these you want, and you use that one. So, you either pick x on 14, or you pick x on 15. This is why it's known as flip-flop. So, basically, you either pick flip, which we'll call x on 14, or you pick flop, which we'll call x on 15. So, you either flip or you flop. So, there's <laughs> the, it's basically just a flip-flop choice, which is why it's called that. So you either pick x on 14 or x on 15, uh, which is the one you're going to use, and the other one you just get rid of that as though it's an intron. Okay, so that means that you instantly double the number of possible uh, glue A1s that you can make. You can either make glue A1 in which you've used x or x on 14, so glue A1, where you used X on 14, so I'll put X on 14 glue A1, which we might call flip glue A1, or you can make flop glue A1, which is where you have used X on 15 glue A1. Okay, so that instantly doubles the possible number of glue A1s we can make. And if we can do this for every single one of these um, glue A1, glue A2, glue A3, glue A4s, then that's going to mean that we get double the amount of... Um, it's going to mean that we get double the amount of... Um, well, actually, it's going to potentially even mean more than that. Oh, actually, um, because these heterotetramers here... The, the glue A1 and the glue A2s that you use, each of those could be in the flip or the flop state. So if we actually want to calculate how many, um, how many um, tetramers we can now make, for each of the homo tetramers, it's doubled the number we can make. So we did have three possible homo tetramers. Now each homo tetramer can either be flip or it can be flop. So we've got six of them. For the hetero tetramers, each of the components can now be in two states. It can be in flip or flop. So to give an example of the glue A2 and the glue A4, you could use glue A2 flip, uh, and then you could use glue A4, which I'll just call A4 flip, okay? Or you could use glue A2 flip with glue A4 flop, or you could use glue A2, uh, A2 flop with glue A4 flip, or you could use glue A4, A2 flop with glue A4 flop. So there are now four possibilities for each one of these heterotetramers. So we have three possible heterotetramers from here that we can make. We need to multiply that by four because each one can now be in these four different possibilities. So we add on 12. So now we've got 18 possible amphoreceptors. So that's one way in which you can... Um, create uh, a bit more uh, variability in these AMPA receptors. And the portion of the polypeptide in each of these subunits that is encoded for by flip or flop is this portion here, which is why I labelled that flip flop. Okay, right. So, uh, next portion where, the next uh, place where we can get a bit of variability uh, into these uh, glutamate uh, subunits is uh, through, again, it's in the splicing process. Excuse me. Right. Uh, so, uh, in this case, what we're going to look at is glue A2, specifically. Right. So, let's say we have the glue A2 gene here. So, this is the glue A2 gene. Okay, right, and basically, um, glue A2 um, will be, um, this is, so this is the glue A2 gene. Glue A2 is going to be transcribed, so it's going to be undergo transcription. You're going to get the piece of pre-mRNA. You're then going to, um, you're then going to splice it, so it can be spliced, and you're going to get the mature mRNA. So let's say this is the mature mRNA. There is further processing that can occur to this piece of mature mRNA. And one of the enzymes that can act on mature mRNA is an enzyme known as adenosine deaminase. Adenosine deaminase. And basically what this enzyme does is it acts on adenosine, which is the nuclear side of adenine. So this mRNA, if I draw, a, a, let's have a little bit of a sample of this piece of mRNA. So here's the phosphate group. Here's the sugar phosphate backbone I'm drawing at the moment. So mRNA is a single-stranded um, nuclear nucleic acid. And uh, it uses ribose as the sugar rather than deoxyribose like in DNA. 
So you have the sugar phosphate backbone here. And basically you have organic bases attached to the uh, second carbon of the sugar phosphate backbone. So let's say we have A here for adenosine. Now it's mRNA, so you don't have thymine. Instead you have uracil. And uh, let's say we have cytosine down there. Okay, so this is a sample of a piece of mRNA. Right, so what is meant by adenosine is adenine bonded to ribose. That is what is known as a nucleoside. So a nucleoside is an organic base, is equal to an organic base uh, bonded with ribose, basically. So um, plus ribose. So if we look on this picture, basically it is these things here. It's the ribose molecule with the organic base. The ribose molecule with the organic base. The ribose molecule with the organic base. All of these are nucleosides. So what's the difference between a nucleoside and a nucleotide? This is, a, this is just an aside, really, but um, I just want to uh, talk about this. Nucleotide means that you have the organic base, the, the ribose group, and the phosphate. So a nucleotide is this whole thing, so it's bigger, basically. So that is the difference between a nucleotide. A nucleotide is an organic base with ribose and the phosphate group. Ribose and the phosphate group. Okay, so that's what a nucleotide is. Right, so adenosine is a nucleoside. Ad what adenosine means is it means the ribose group with adenine. So that is what adenosine is. It is not um, adenosine, the ribose group, and the phosphate. That would be adenosine monophosphate, more commonly referred to as AMP. Adenosine um, monophosphate would be it, would be the nucleotide version of um, adenosine. Right, okay. So, uh, what does the enzyme adenosine deaminase do? Well, basically, it's going to act on these adenosine groups within the mRNA uh, that you've made for this glue A2 um, gene up there. Okay, and what it's going to do is it's going to specifically act on this organic base. So now what we need to do is we need to show the structure of adenine to see uh, what this is going to do further. So, um, Adenine basically is a purine, and purine rings consist of a pyrimidine ring with an imidazole, uh, an, an imidazole ring. So a pyrimidine ring is a six-membered ring that's very similar in structure to benzene, like so. So you have a six-membered ring, but instead of all, all of the six members being carbons, instead two of the members are nitrogens. And the two nitrogens have to be in these specific positions relative to one another. So you can't have a nitrogen here and a nitrogen here. They have to be have a single carbon in between them, basically. Okay, and then you have alternating double and single bonds, basically. So that is a pyrimidine ring. Now, if it was a pure pyrimidine ring, you'd have hydrogen off all of these four carbons to saturate them. However, we're drawing it in the context of adenine, and adenine is not just a pure pyrimidine ring, otherwise it would just be a pure pyrimidine ring. Okay, so... To turn a pyrimidine ring into a purine ring, what you have to do is you have to add on another ring down here, which is called an imidazole ring. And an imidazole ring consists of two nitrogens off each of these carbons, and then a double bond from this nitrogen to this carbon, which is where the imide bit of the imidazole uh, name comes from. Uh, a nitrogen double bonded to a carbon is an imide bond. Uh, and then finally, just a single bond there. That's the purine ring now. So this is a purine ring. OK, uh, right. Um, and I'll just put the other names. A pyrimidine ring was the six-membered ring analogous to benzene, but with nitrogens. Pyrimidine ring. And this five-membered ring here is an imidazole ring. Imidazole ring. OK, right, so to turn this into adenine, you put an amino group up there, you put a hydrogen down here, and a hydrogen off here, and then this nitrogen down here is what is linked to ribose. So it's basically this linker here, so I'll just write ribose down here, because the, the, uh, the um, adenosine deaminase is not going to affect the ribose, it's completely going to act on the adenine group here. So this overall now is adenine.
Okay, right, so what this enzyme is going to do is it's going to, um, it's going to remove this uh, amine group here, and it's going to replace it with an oxygen, basically. Uh, so let me draw out what, um, what happens to this ring. So I'll try and draw it in the same orientation. So you have the nitrogen here. Now it's only singly bonded to that carbon, and instead that carby, carbon is bonded to oxygen instead. Then it comes down here, and everything's still the same. You put a hydrogen on that nitrogen to um, replace the bond that it's lost between the carbon, and uh, then you've got a double bond still down there, and then pretty much after that, everything is just the same. So that's what's changed. You've taken that amino group off, and you've put a carbonyl group in its place. That forces you to break this double, but one of the, these double bonds here, and uh, then you stick a hydrogen on there to replace the um, bond that the nitrogen has got lost. The imidazole ring is completely unaffected by this. Okay, so that basically is the reaction that uh, adenosine deaminase catalyzes. It converts uh, adenine into this structure here, and this structure here is called hypoxanthine. Hypoxanthine, hypoxanthine. Uh, so hypoxanthine is this um, this structure here without the ribose. Now, when hypoxanthine is bonded to ribose, the structure that that is called, so the nucleoside that you make from ribose and hypoxanthine, is um, called inosine. Okay, right. So, uh, inosine is an alternative uh, nucleoside that you can have in RNA, and the, uh, the ribosome does recognize it. Okay, so, basically, what this adenosine deaminase is going to do to your mRNA is it's going to go along and it's going to turn this adenine into an inosine, basically. So, this is going to be turned into I rather than A, and that happens at a specific point, at a single specific point on this mRNA of uh, the GLUA2 um, gene. Okay, now uh, what happens is that the ribosome can read this, it, can, it knows what inosine is, it, it's not like this is something new to it, it does know what that is, and it changes the codon basically, slightly, and what's going to happen is that the ribosome is going to put in a different amino acid because the inosine overall changes the codon uh, and uh, the ribosome therefore puts in and matches it to a different tRNA with a different amino acid. So this causes a substitution mutation basically. Okay, so, well not a mutation but a substitution, a different amino acid to go in. So this leads to specifically uh, the amino acid at position 586 changing. Okay, so residue 586 changes. And the way it changes is that you change um, the amino acid glutamine. So the original amino acid, if you don't uh, change the A to the I, the original amino acid that the codon coded for, and you can imagine that this is the codon here. So the original amino acid that that codon coded for was glutamine. And this is, by the way, is just a picture. I don't know that these are the combinations of uh, organic bases around the specific adenine that is changed. Uh, but uh, you you originally uh, have a codon which codes for glutamine at position 586, and that changes basically to an arginine. Okay, right. And the way that you would write that change is that the uh, single amino acid, single letter symbol for glutamine is a Q, and the single letter symbol for arginine is an R. So you would write that Q at position 586 has become an arginine, basically. Right. Okay, um, so uh, now let's get another piece of paper and discuss what the effect of this is. Now, basically, the effect of this is that if you make a, um, a uh, AMPA receptor out of the GLUA1 uh, subunit, uh, which has had this glutamine substituted for this arginine, then basically the effect that it has is to reduce the permeability of this channel to calcium. And to understand why that is, we probably need to have a look at uh, the structure of those two amino acids, glutamine and arginine. 
So the structure of the amino acid glutamine is as follows. So if we draw the basic structure of the amino acid, here is the alpha carbon with an amino group coming off it, the hydrogen, and the carboxyl group. So in the case of glutamine, uh, the structure is basically the same as glutamate, so draw out glutamate, but you have made the primary amide of glutamates. You've bonded an amine group down here now instead of the hydroxyl group. So this is glutamine. Glutamine. Okay, right. And we are changing this to arginine. So this is the structure of arginine. Okay, so again you have the basic, um, basic structure of an amino acid here. And then uh, you have three carbons, so the R group of arginine consists of three carbons, like so. And then it has a nitrogen atom in the chain after that carbon. Nitrogen here, a hydrogen coming off the nitrogen, then another carbon which is doubly bonded to a single nitrogen up there with a hydrogen, and then bonded to an amine group below, so that is arginine. Okay, now Arginine has these, this amine group at, uh, you know, right down here. And this amine group has a free pair of electrons, which basically have a nice negative charge. It's a nice center of negative charge. And protons, uh, hydrogen ions, protons, like to come and sit nearby these um, free, this lone pair of electrons. And that overall ensures that this this end nearly always has a positive charge nearby it because of this proton sitting by uh, the lone pair on the amino group. Okay, so if you make a, um, a amper receptor out of glue A2, and you can either make a homo tetramer of glue A2, or you can make a hetero tetramer of glue A2. So either, either, so I'll draw these two cases as separate. Okay, so here are the that's that this one be the homo tetram of glue A2. So all of these are now glue A2, so I'll shade them all in the same colour. So that's the homo tetram of glue A2, whereas this one's the hetero tetram, whereas on, where only those two are um, actually glue A2s. Right, uh, so uh, what this results in is this amino acid at position 586 actually faces into the pore. So now what you have done is you've taken a neutral amino acid, because this amino group, you might say, but this has got an amino group on it. Why doesn't this accept a lone pair? Uh, why doesn't this accept a proton and get a positive charge? Well, amino groups that are in amide links like this never accept protons, not under any sort of physiological condition anyway. Um, Okay, and that's um, some fact from organic chemistry that amide, amine groups that are in amide groups, like so, uh, do not become protonated in the way that normal amine groups do. Okay, uh, so this is a neutral amino acid. You've replaced this neutral amino acid that sort of faces into the pore, so I'll draw it quite extremely like this. It's facing into the pore from here. You've replaced that neutral amino acid with this uh, char positively charged amino acid. And basically what that does is it reduces the permeability of this pore to calcium, because calcium is a divalent cation, so it's going to be repelled by the positive charge on these amino acids. So that's why it reduces permeability of the channel to potassium. Reduces permeability of channel to potassium. And you might wonder, well, you know, sodium and potassium, they have positive charge on them as well, but they are, have it less extreme. They are also going to feel repelled by this, but nowhere near as much as the calcium ions, because the calcium ions are uh, divalent cations, so they're going to feel more repelled uh, by this than the um, sodium or the potassium. Reduces permeability to calcium. So basically, it is going to reduce the permeability to sodium and potassium as well, but it's going to reduce that so much less than it will reduce the permeability to calcium. So the relative permeability of the channel to the monovalent cations over the divalent cations is going to uh, increase. Okay, uh, so um, it all the other effect that this has is in the hetero, uh, the homo tetramer over here, where you've used four glue A2s. You've now got four positively charged uh, amino acids now facing each other. This basically is not stable. So if you make your glue A2s with these arginine groups rather, excuse me, than these glutamine groups, then uh, you cannot put 
four gluates with the arginines in rather than the glutamines in um, together and form a homotetramer because they just repel each other apart. Uh, so I should stress that point that uh, you can make the glue A2 where you've got the glutamine in 5, uh, 8, 6 uh, rather than uh, the arginine. Um, basically, this is a way of increasing variability. You can either make glue A2 where in position 5, 8, 6 you have glutamine or you can make it where you have arginine. But basically, if you make it with arginine, you are not going to get four of those uh, with the arginine sti sticking together to make a, a homotetramer, basically. Okay, so that's all for this video. We'll continue our discussion of amper in the next video.